Hey everybody, John Wagnon here with Dev Central, and we're coming to you with another Lightboard lesson video. And today we're going to talk about a recent DDoS attack that was just launched at the very popular website GitHub. Uh, so you guys may have seen this in the news, but I wanted to kind of break down exactly what happened in the attack and uh, explain the methodology behind it, and then also give you a little bit of uh, um, maybe some advice on, hey, this is how you can um, mitigate this for yourself if this were to happen to you. All right, so last week, uh, GitHub was the victim of the largest DDoS attack ever recorded in human history. I guess we can say that. Um, so what happened was uh, the attackers took advantage of this, uh, this caching system known as memcached. And so to understand the attack, let me explain the way that that system works uh, first, and then I'll explain the attack. All right, so memcached, I'll just write that up here, memcached. Memcached is a caching system. It's a distributed open source caching system that a lot of websites uh, that use extensive um, database calls will implement uh, because it allows information to be cached there and be presented to a user in a much quicker way than if you were to uh, actually you know, call the database and then get you know, data back from the database and then present that to the user. So basically what this is, is you have a, a distributed network of servers. Uh, so I'll just kind of draw like you know, a few, few servers here. You, know, you can employ however many you need. Uh, but these servers um, certainly have memory on them. Memory and and so whenever a uh, whenever a user requests a website and a lot of social networking sites or sites that again have a lot of extensive database calls will employ this uh, if a user um, will a user's out here and request your web server so I'll just say you know sends in a request to your to your web application let's say it's a web app then the web application the user may say hey I want the latest you know, update on this picture, or I want the latest whatever. And in order to give the latest thing, the truth is the data that resides there is probably uh, held somewhere in some kind of database. I'll draw a database back here as well. So you've got, you know, a, a system of databases back here, and you may have several of those as well. Um, so instead of the web server querying the database directly, the, the web server is going to say, hey, memcached D server, uh, do you have the data? And if the memcached server has the data, it's going to respond, and then the web application is going to present that to the user. It's much, much faster, like I said, than this uh, than the web application of the web server coming down to a database, making a database call, doing a, a read and write, just all that stuff. This right here is much, much slower. So the nature of the way that this memcached D server system works is that the most recent data is held in these memcached D servers, um, and so if there's any kind of older data, that kind of thing, it's going to um, it's going to hold the newer stuff, um, you know, instead of the older stuff. Uh, but nonetheless, it's going to fill up with tons of web server data. Uh, and it's arbitrary data. It's, it, could be, um, it could be session data. Uh, all kinds of different stuff can be stored here. All right, so that's kind of the nature of the background behind memcached. Again, user accesses your web application. We're going to go to, we're basically going to go to to the, the memory, like the caching system, before we go back to the database. That's the inherent uh, you know, process for how this thing works. Um, a couple of things, though, that are interesting about memcached servers, when these were set up, they were set up with, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write a couple of attributes here. Uh, I'm going to put no auth or no authentication at all. They were, they were never intended to be exposed to the public internet. And so the idea is that we're not going to introduce authentication uh, to these because no unauthenticated person is ever necessarily going to access these. Um, you could argue the debate about, you know, did they need to add that or not, but the, but the point is no authentication mechanism was ever designed in the memcached system. All righty. So they don't have that, um, and they're never supposed to be exposed to the public Internet, like I said. Uh, a couple other little things is that one megabyte um, is the, I'm going to put limit per 
piece of memory stored on this server. So any one piece of data, as it were, that's stored on these servers, uh, it's limited to one megabyte um, in size. Uh, so anyway, so whenever, uh, whenever someone asks for something, any one, any one piece is going to be one megabyte or smaller. Um, okay, another thing that you can do, because there's no authentication, is anyone can load data. So I'm just going to put load uh, data on here, on these things. Alrighty, so there's no authentication. You don't have to tell it who you are. And like any kind of caching system, I guess, that you would think about, um, it stores data and it allows for a user to load data onto it. All right, so with all that in mind, um, what could happen is you could have an attacker out here. So I'm going to put, you know, attacker bad guy out here. Attacker can, can first of all, scan the internet. This is, this is what happened to GitHub. The attacker can scan the internet and say, hey, internet, show me any kind of internet, public internet facing memcached um, server system out there. And, uh, and one of the recent reports that I just saw uh, showed that there was in the neighborhood of 100,000 of these publicly facing memcached servers out there in the internet. So 100,000, not just of the servers, but of these distributed systems, like individual instances of this, you know, this whole thing going on. So 100,000 options for you to go and, and tap into. Um, and because there's no authentication, you can just get right into it. You can start loading data onto these servers and certainly you, you can request data from those servers. So as soon as you find these publicly facing memcached servers, what the attackers do is they say, they send a get request. So they'll say get, you know, and I'm just gonna put data, whatever. And then they'll say the source IP, I'll just say source IP is, I'll, I'll put, you know, 1.2.3.4 just for example purposes. All righty. Well, let's say that here's GitHub down here. GitHub is doing its thing. It's having a great day. It's keeping all its customers happy. It's not doing anything to anybody, right? And let's say GitHub's IP address is 1.2.3.4. All right, what the attackers do is they say, hey, publicly facing memcached D server system, I want to get data, maybe data that I just loaded on there that I know is big, which, which again, by the way, because there's no authentication, because these things are, are able to be manipulated, because inherently they're supposed to be in a protected area, this one megabyte limit can also be configured so you can say, hey, you know what, allow two megabyte limits now, or allow three, or whatever you want to put. So maybe an attacker gets in there, changes the limit size on any one piece of data, <laughs> and then loads a ton of data in there and then sends a GET request for that data. All right, so you can start to see how all this is going to build up. Well, whenever it sends that GET request, the memcached D server sends a stream of UDP packets. I'll just put, uh, I'll put UDP packets and they're going to be 1400, 1400 bytes in size and it's just going to stream those packets to the recipient of the GET request. Well, if you spoof the source IP address, the attacker does, and you make the source IP address the IP address of your victim, then this memcached D system is going to send all of those packets to the victim. And so the victim, again, it's sitting there, you know, GitHub's having a great day doing its thing, doing great, doing great work, and then all of a sudden it gets flooded with all these UDP packets from a memcached D server, and they're like, what's going on? We didn't even ask for these. And the attacker's like, I know you didn't ask for them. I asked for them on your behalf, but you're getting flooded. So what happens, or what happened to the GitHub, or in the GitHub instance, is the, uh, the flood of data that came into GitHub was 1.35 terabits per second traffic that just flooded this thing. Um, and then, and that lasted for about eight minutes, actually, which is not a, not a really long time. Um, lasted for about eight minutes, the attackers kind of settled down a little bit, and then they came in a few minutes later, they ramped it up, it wasn't quite 1.35 terabits per second of data flooding their site, um, but they did kind of hit again, and then they settled down. So after about 20 minutes or so, the whole thing was over, uh, which is, uh, it's good news for GitHub because it didn't last that long, um, but it leaves us with some interesting points still to talk about. Um, one is that when you send a 
Git request, when an attacker sends a Git request to these memcached servers, they can send a very, very small request. So like this Git data, the, the request size of that can be just literally just bytes in size. But then the actual response, these UDP packets, is just going to start streaming megabytes and megabytes of data uh, to the victim. And so that's, what, that's the nature of what we call an amplification attack. So the amplification attack is that you amplify the size of the request. So the size of the request, again, may be, let's say it's 200 bytes, for example. Well, then when the response comes out from the servers, it may be, you know, 100 megabytes plus in size. So the response is an amplified version of the request. So the attacker doesn't need that many resources, frankly, to realize a massively huge attack against a victim. All right, so that's, um, so, so that's kind of the nature of the amplification attack. What GitHub did is whenever they started to detect this massive influx of, uh, of this data or of all these you know, packets coming in, then they, they rerouted, I'll put, a, uh, I'll put down here DDoS uh, scrubbing. Scrubbing Center. All right, so they have this DDoS scrubbing center uh, that they use, and when they noticed that all this data was coming in, that they were getting DDoS attacked, then they routed all their traffic through the DDoS scrubbing center. The DDoS scrubbing center, by nature, is going to take all of the data, and it's going to drop all the DDoS bad traffic, and then it's going to allow the legitimate traffic to come on through into, in this case, GitHub. Uh, which, by the way, F5 has this exact capability. Uh, we, can, we can detect the DDoS attack, we can scrub it, we've got cloud-based scrubbers, we've got a lot of different options for that. So if you're ever interested in that, you can check it out. It's, it's really cool technology. Um, but anyway, once the, uh, once the scrubbing center did its job, I think that's part of why the attackers backed off and they said, okay, we're gonna be done with this because the DDoS scrubbing center did its job. Uh, and then GitHub you know, came back online. They didn't have to route the traffic through them, through the DDoS scrubbing center after a certain period of time because they knew that the attack was over. Um, so uh, so that's, that's the way that they mitigated and kind of got around this thing. Some organizations say, hey, we're just going to have a massively huge pipe into our web application. So even if we get DDoSed, then we can handle that. And that's, I would say that that's good to an extent, but with the size of these DDoS attacks now, it's going to be very difficult to create a pipe that's big enough to handle all of these things. So you probably want to employ some kind of scrubbing center. Uh, the other thing that I would note very quickly is that if you are an organization that utilizes this memcached um, you know, caching system, then make sure that your servers are not publicly exposed to the internet uh, because you may be part of the problem. So, uh, so that's one thing we can do on the, hey, let's clean up the internet side of the house, is that we can make sure these memcached servers are not uh, internet exposed to the internet. If you're the customer side of this house and you're just trying to run your web application, I would say you need to have a DDoS mitigation plan in place. Having a scrubbing center as an option is, uh, is probably a good idea depending on you know, your business needs and all that, but it's probably something you ought to look into. Um, all right, so that's the, that's the basics of what happened to GitHub. 1.35 terabits per second, we've never seen that before. Um, and good for GitHub and their DDoS mitigation you know, mechanisms, they were able to, to uh, mitigate this one and, and there was not a huge hiccup. Um, but again, the bad news is that there's still 100,000 of these Memcache D uh, systems out there exposed to the internet. So attackers could totally do this again, uh, either against GitHub or some other unsuspecting victim. So, uh, so be safe out there. Make sure you stay, uh, stay alert that DDoS attacks are real and they're, uh, they, can, they can be very, uh, uh, they, they can do a lot of damage. So, uh, so thanks for watching this Lightboard lesson video with us today. If you like this, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, by clicking on the DC ball right here, and we will see you guys out there in the community.